my value is what the hell I think my value is. And it's your choice to spend your money on it or not. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, I used to just $35 a head for a thing, this, that. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? One of the best quotes that I've ever heard was, my prices aren't based on what you can afford, it's based on what I'm worth. That's well one said. of the, the the best quotes I've ever heard. Yes, and like, because people try to nickel and dime everybody, it time. comes with that when you try All to the time. train On fighting. Septic, dude, people would be like, "Man!" <laughs> In five, four, three, two, one. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Genius Brain Podcast. Cheers, my friend. We have a very special guest, and you know, being part of the food world, I always love bringing food people into this podcast. And actually. I, I haven't actually watched uh, Master Chef after like the fourth season, you know, but only because I started fucking hating that one guy. What's his name? Justin? The, the bald fucking Italian fuck. What's his oh, name? Oh, Joe, Joe Bastianich. I fucking hate that guy. I hate him with everything that I have. There's a lot of people that have the same feelings that you have about Joe. First of all, because here's the thing. He's always been good to me. Joe has always been good, but a lot of people do have a lot of problems with Joe. It's just the way that he speaks. Either he's doing it through th for theatrics, but the weird thing is this, right? You have two chefs on there, right? You have Gordon Ramsay and you have... Um, Aron. Yes. And then you have this man. He's a restaurateur. Right. But he speaks as if he's the best chef on earth. This is very true. You're a fucking restaurateur. Correct. You shut the fuck up. <laughs> This guy sits here, he eats this fucking food, and here's the thing, he doesn't give constructive criticism. I think that's what I hate about him on the show. He eats it and he goes, this is trash. Why is it trash, you bald fuck? Like, I, lo I love the, I love, see, I'm an analytics guy, so <laughs> that's one thing about uh, Gordon and Aron, them being chefs, they would tell you exactly kind of why it needs it. This needs more acid, this needs more salt, maybe the temperature's this, that, more hard sear. I do agree with that, that Joe's criticism was definitely way less constructive. I need I something. By the way, introduce yourself. I'll, I'll introduce you first. This is Noah Sims from MasterChef season 10. Right. Season right? 10. So, fuck him. <laughs> I just wanted to put it out there. You might like and, him. And now, I, on that, no, absolutely. <laughs> I love people always God. shooting from the hip. I mean, it, to each bitch. of their own. Let me ask you something on that show. Hit me with him. Who do you hate the most out of all three judges? <laughs> that, I, I don't hate anybody, but definitely just man. like Joe. Aron was always... <laughs> uh, Gordon is such a powerhouse. He is such a cool cat. Like, yeah. when you get around Gordon, like... It, it, it's there's just like everything's gonna be okay like it's bob marley's playing like when he's around like <laughs> yeah, everything's yeah. gonna be okay like yeah. no matter what kind of situation i'm in in the kitchen this guy's like you know russell crow master and commander <laughs> yeah. like we are going to be okay yeah. so Aron is a goofball that i like the way his style always constructive always helping hands-on approach um and then joe like you said as a restaurateur more more abrasive uh i'm sure when he hears this he'll love to hear that but um the the thing that i liked the best about um the judge selection was was you could really tell when they were really trying to help like you yeah. could tell when there was reality about it but then you could tell when it was like they're saying to the heck with the re like this is really here we are like yeah. this is really what i want um and our own our own and, and gordon were exceptional at that um, yeah I, I i enjoyed both of them thoroughly and i didn't have a problem with joe as well um he was always i think very open with me but a lot of other times he would of course come off as exactly how you're stating like where where the hell are you getting that? Like, why <laughs> would you say it like yeah. that? Like, you're like speaking in blanket statements. Like, could you be a little bit more exact with that comment? Yeah. Just a little bit more pinpoint? That's no, how I, I always felt when he was, because it wasn't critiques. It was just insults. And I'm like, I agree. hey, bro, you got to say, you got to give them something. You right. can't just say, I don't understand why you would do this. This is the dumbest thing I've ever right. seen. You're right. No, why? and I say that to any, I would say that to anything. I think you're 100% accurate on that. And it's like, what is, for me on any show, it's like, if I'm going to give criticism in anything in life, 
I believe that if you're going to strike it, you need to be able to like, where are you coming from? And be like, well, some people don't earn that. I was like, well, then just don't say anything. Then. <laughs> like, like, I'm going to say this, you me monster, and I'm going to get this off of my chest, and I'm going to feel better, but it's like, where is this helping me at? It's like, yeah, you're yeah, just yeah. doing that for you. You're not doing this for me. Like, you're supposed to be a coach. A coach is supposed yeah. to be able to benefit the student and the pupil. So yeah. is this for you or for me? Yeah. So you're you're right on that point. So how did, how did you get okay? So if for those of you who don't watch uh, Master Chef, I watched the the first four seasons and intermittently I've been in and out watching the other episodes. Like Master Chef is interesting because it's not it's not um, famous chefs. It's you guys right. are originally like home cooks right. that have a, a very unique talent when it comes to food. What is the selection process? How did you get uh, selected for the show? You know, you're gonna have you're gonna have so many different stories of people because um, there's so many different ways they've done it. Mine was just such a big story, like so many chapters. I mean, it was a long process. Some people go, were like VIP, where they like saw them off of Instagram and they like boosted them through the first couple mm -hmm. rounds and things like that. My buddy uh, gave me a uh, message on Facebook uh, and said, this is 13 miles from your house. Don't be a bitch. Go out there <laughs> because we want to see if you're as good as we think you are. So mm -hmm. I was like, game on. And then whenever I went out there, for me, it was it was a, I'm going to get there 30 minutes early. I'm going to be, mm -hmm. I'm going to be one of the first ones. Little did I know, little did I know that there'd be like hundreds and thousands of people going to these things. And it was absurd because, excuse me, <clears throat> because you saw so many different people, different yeah. walks of life flying in from all over the country. Like, where are you from? It was like 13 minutes down the road. <laughs> like, like, I'm from Ohio. I'm like, Jesus mm. Christ. Like, you, like, where did you stay? It's like, below the airport and this and this and this. I'm like, okay, well, I'm like whatever and you're supposed to for the first step you're supposed to bring a dish that you could prepare five minutes before like set it up but it had to be hot served hot cold served cold and you had no microwave anything like that so i was like well that's an easy one for me i was like i can control the temperature of cold a lot more yeah. than hot because i'll just have it in a in a cooler like i'll just bring my cooler because you can bring a cooler yeah instead of trying like thermosing a soup or something some of the stuff people were bringing was so asinine. Someone brought these grit sticks with guacamole, and they were hardened. They were cold. So I made I made a, a steak beef tartare. Made this little beautiful. I I had everything mise en place out. So as soon as I said five minutes, I had my homemade French baguettes. Whipped it together with my mustard, my capers, all this stuff, and it was perfectly set. Making 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 my impact was running analytics the whole time from the get go from the first room which had hundreds of people to walking up the stairs seeing that they were handing signs out wanting to see your personality immediately yeah. I read straight through that they're like like take a picture and they're handing this random prop and I'm like freaking like a crazy person and like getting everyone to laugh and. Then I literally was walking into every room being like thinking that there's very, very important people in this room pretending like they're not very important. Mm -hmm. So like I'm perusing the room and then all of a sudden I run into two British accents and I'm like, okay, well that jumps off the page is different than everybody else in here. I'm like, okay, I might be onto something here. After we did the cook or whatever, we went to, to uh, it went from 80 to 40 to 20 and they split to 10 and 10. When we walk in the 10 and 10, Natalka and Jen, who are the executive producers of MasterChef, were two of the people I already met in the room before because I was introducing myself and talking to everybody on what I do. Uh, I got on to the top five there. They gave me a ticket. I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to L.A. It's great. No, there's like freaking like five or six more meetings I had. There was like a 564-question psych evaluation test. Really? Multiple, multiple, multiple. Uh, we did uh, two, two huge uh, sessions with a psychologist, separate psychologist. Uh, and I was like, so man, you guys they don't are trying to, they're trying to make no crazy people get on there. But I was like, oh. no, they're not. They're balancing the crazy. Because some of the sons of bitches that were on there are absolutely batshit insane. So they were trying to get a good balance. Yeah, a good yeah. and a young on that. So uh, it was a hell of a process doing videos, sending videos in just constantly. It was months and months and months. And then finally, like, hey, listen, we want you to come to L.A. Damn, like, the process finally. is that fucking long. long 
time. Yes, months and months and months. And then you get these people on there. Here's one for me. Maybe you're different. But like you get the people that are like, I've heard them people get on podcasts. Like, yeah, I was a VIP. They kind of got me through the thing and this and that. And I, <laughs> yeah. I was like, why are you bragging about like, well, don't you want to like say like you started down at the bottom now yeah, you're yeah. here? Yeah. Like, it's like, yeah, I was uh, falsely inflated and, uh, you know, my value, I didn't actually finish very good on the show, but, uh, you know, they thought I was going to be good. So they were me monster on VIP. I well, hear that all the time. Well, you know, you find out too, like just in anything in life, there's, I think people are better at talking about what they do than actually doing it. Oh my you gosh. Know? Especially because like social media yes. now, right? Yes. And, um, like I see this a lot just with, I mean, even restaurants are like that, right? Because the, the Instagram game is so fucking popular. Yes. You can make something look as good as you want on a picture. But when you get there, the expectation versus reality is very fucking different. Boy, you're going to get really excited then when I tell you one of the cool things I'm going to be doing. Oh, really? So, yeah, today I did the HWU is as a HWU now has half a million on TikTok. And the guy that we were with was Liam. He's got two and a half million or whatever. Pretty big mm -hmm. accounts. Uh, Instagram, uh, HWU's, uh, I think 80,000 or whatever, but they're starting to really going to go up. Um, the, what, what we've got going on is trying to get a, 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 basically a, a set mark where we're able to start building this, um, I don't know, like community or whatever, trying to get that rolling. And coming out here, coming out here has been such a game, a game changing experience for like coming out here and seeing y'all and like feeling that energy last night and yeah, getting yeah. things rolling. You're hey man, it's pandemic right now, dude. This is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but that's, but it's been, no, but it's been really awesome kind of seeing like the, the content creations and things like that and trying to make the content. I I don't do, I don't do all the super content things i'm like building and building and building and slowly yeah, yeah, trying yeah. to get better justin and them are fantastic at that though so you're from uh cleveland ohio no he's no the guy that was over liam was actually from cleveland i'm from north georgia blue ridge oh okay blue ridge georgia so i mean the, the scene and the vibe is so different <laughs> you know what I mean? nine day nine <laughs> I mean, day because like you know food scene too is, is is so different out here like one of the things that i love about like la's food scene is that we have a lot of towns here that have been around here for a while. Yes. So I, I make this comparison to New York a lot because I go to New York a lot. Mm -hmm. Like I love New York's food scene a lot. Right. But the thing that I think LA does differently from uh, New York is that we don't believe in the seasonal vegetable bullshit. Like in, in K-Town, you're not going to see a seasonal vegetable pop up in this mom and pop Korean shop. They're like, I don't give a fuck what your seasonal vegetable is. This I love is what, that. This I is love what that. we serve. Sticking, sticking to what you know, sticking what's real. Exactly. I love that. So I if you go that. to like this Peruvian joint, they're not going to put the hot new item out right now into their menu. This is what we've had. This is what you get. If not, you go fuck off. I <laughs> love know? that. No, I love that. You know, this, the food scene is so different. Really, it's so different. In the state of Georgia, there's a section right above Atlanta, which when you come visit me uh, in Georgia, I'm going to blow your mind, but it right above Atlanta is a Buford Highway, okay? okay? And I swear to God, you could take a two-mile stretch of that and get 10 restaurants that are going to be 100% family-owned. There's freaking generationally yeah. family-owned. Of different, you could get like a a Sri Lankan, a Korean, a Guatemalan, <laughs> a Chinese. A, some of the best dad go. I've been around the world a couple times. I've eaten a lot of really good food. I've been so blessed with being able to eat some of the best food on the planet. And I'm telling you what. The food that kicks out of that dad gum two miles of Buford High. I mean, some of the best, some of the best banh mi's, which I'm a huge banh mi. I love a great Vietnamese banh mi sandwich, like $3. If you buy five of them, they give you one for free. So you get literally six of these giant sandwiches for $15 cash, and they're just the best sandwiches. Have you been out over here in uh, like the SGV? No, I'm not. That's all that shit over there. See, we don't so, have anything else though. But just you just have that in Georgia. You have that, and then nothing else. In but, LA, you have literal <laughs> like just well, you know, thirty miles this way, thirty miles <laughs> that way. We got like one yeah. little wheelhouse in Georgia. Well, it's interesting because like years ago, like because I used to, I grew up eating bun meats, right? So in Sacramento, <laughs> California, which is like I don't know, like four hundred miles from here, right? Mm -hmm. It's State capital, but they have right. a huge uh, Vietnamese community out there. So back in the day, bun mi sandwiches were a dollar twenty-five. 
So one <laughs> fucking sandwich was a dollar twenty-five. Obviously, because of inflation, it's now like two to three bucks, right? But I grew up like my parents would just have like lunch for us, and it was four dollars for everybody. See, this you're you're my type of people, a hundred percent. Like I literally would go in there, and here's the trick. Let me tell you how I love to eat my bond me. So. Mm-hmm. I go in there, they they always call me hero because I give them a five dollar tip. Always as soon as I go in, I walk to the counter, give them a five dollar tip immediately. There's like four little tiny ladies that are just <laughs> banging out these sandwiches just like a freaking steamroller. And I always go there and give them the five dollars. I go up there, I say I need five number sixes, which is the all everything. It's got the jow meat, everything. Mm-hmm. And like the the head cheese and all this absolutely, stuff. Absolutely, yeah. everything. And <clears throat> and what I do is is just sit there, chill out, listen to everybody. It's a little chitter chatter. They're banging out these sandwiches for fifteen dollars. They give you six of these sandwiches. They are absolutely humongous. Down in Atlanta, downtown Atlanta, they're like nine dollars, and they're not even half as good. I like to take those sandwiches and put them in my refrigerator for like three or four days. All right. I want everything to kind of get everybody in the pool together and just kind of congeal in. Then I take a wet paper towel, wrap it in around the parchment paper that they're in, and put it in the oven at like 325. It steams the outside of that and heats Mm -hmm. it completely up where the outside has this nice little crunch and it goes into the soft, a little bit of spicy sriracha mayo on the inside. And I swear that sandwich is the crunch of the daikon, everything that works after it's been in the refrigerator, all the flavors are perfectly melted or just, it's one of the finest $3 <laughs> items. And, with, and, at, and at six sandwiches, you're like at $2 and 60 cents a sandwich, which I don't know any places you can get a good sandwich for two fifty. I mean, it, it's one of those things. It's like, like bun me sandwiches too, you know, became hyper popular. I guess recently. Right. Which is great. Like I, I appreciate it a lot. Uh, it's, it's weird though. When, uh, there's a lot of these mom and pop stores that people don't really know about, and they've been doing like bun mis forever, and they don't get their bread shipped. It's a fucking bakery first. Hundred <laughs> percent. You know, that's, so. that's hundred percent. This is a bakery that I guess Mon Quinn's is what it's <laughs> called. I literally make their bakery right in the next, literally right mm-hmm. next door in that, and it's the section. So like where we're at right now, <laughs> literally like three miles away from here, is like my favorite bun mis spot, and they do two separate ones. They do the typical, you know, Vietnamese French baguette, and right. they actually have a shorter, stubbier one, which a lot of people don't do, right. and that's my favorite. And I always double up on the pate. Yeah. So I yes. love Vietnamese pate is the shit to me. Yes. Like it's. It's so delicious. fucking good. It's delicious. And, yes, and that's agreed. like the thing that people don't see a lot because I know. Uh, people- you want that oily, greasy <laughs> smire. You want all that deliciousness on there. And then people- sometimes you get a flat top and they toast it with the pate. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yes. There's, like, there's this weird. Like sometimes I always have like this aversion towards like certain like uh, like fusion food. Right. Because I feel like sometimes people don't do it very well. I mean, you know, like, for example, like everybody started wrapping things in a tortilla and it doesn't make it fusion food. Right. Because Vietnamese right. food is, is a technically fusion food like a bun mi. Right. That's French influence. Right. The pate. Well, the baguette. Well, you just nailed something. And I want to really talk about that. I think the word fusion has been a bastard, bastardized word, I think. And what you just stated about a banh mi, I believe a banh mi is the ultimate fusion dish. And people toss around fusion too much where it's forced. Yeah. You can't have forced fusion. That's fraud. Okay. (laughs) All right. Forced fusion equals fraud. Mm -hmm. Something that is a natural progression of, well, we got a lot of French people around here making bread. Well, we've got a lot of this together. What if we put A to B together and let's see what happens? And it just goes. That I I think that a bon me is like one of the greatest fusions of all time. It 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 it's something that came together out of necessity and it's flawless. And it's yeah. it just it's I could eat them like a wood chipper. Like you could <laughs> line them up and it's just zzz, zzz, I mean just it's one of my favorite things on the planet to like eat. You, you'll see that a lot with like like Peruvian food is one of my favorite, right? Mm-hmm. Because you see, first of all, they use soy sauce and everything. Mm-hmm. The, the Chinese influence in Peruvian food is mm-hmm. highly prevalent when you have lomo saltado. Right. Like they even have their version of their, uh, like the chopped, the fried rice. Right. Right. And you, you can see that. And right. it's almost like when you eat it, it, sound, it tastes like a distinct dish. It doesn't seem like it stemmed from something else. And I think that's, that's the key when you create fusion food, when you eat it and it has its own identity. Absolutely. Right. So, you know, when a lot of these restaurants were opening up and, you know, I think because people were trying to catch on a food wave, which by the way, I personally think it's not, a, if you ever open up a restaurant, if you're catching up on a food wave, your restaurant's going to disappear in three years. Agreed. <laughs> it, 100%. It, it no question. all the time. Like I've no seen question. restaurants in Los Angeles 
that I oh, went God, to. I'm sure. I'm sure. They had four and a half stars, but they but their food was very, you know, wacky or whatever. Two years, they're gone. They still had a thousand reviews, but if you base your food on a craze, right. it's not going to last. People get tired of that stuff. Agreed. Agreed. A, a lot of the restaurants probably that you and I like, right, are based off of a restaurant that has one amazing dish and they fucking smash at it. I need my buddy, my buddy. I This is, I cannot, like that, we don't even really need to talk anymore about the podcast now that I know <laughs> I can trust you with my life after stating that. I cannot explain <laughs> the amount of times that I explain to people about how when I say I'm going to open my restaurant that I might have three main courses, maybe an appetizer, two appetizers, maybe two or three desserts, and you're going to think it's the greatest restaurant ever because yeah. I'm going to smash the fuck out of every one of those. It's going to be like a Moab of big, bold, beautiful flavors dropping every time. What the fuck do I go and anyone else that they don't think about the analytics of like, you go to this place just because they have really good fries. You go to this place just because it is, and people don't think about that. It's like when you go to like a big chain restaurant, they're like, oh, I need a cheesecake factory, the shit out of it, and get like a damn novel yeah. of a menu, and you're just like freaking Marco Polo here with the map, just like, what the hell is going on here? We're going over here to this place, and it's like... I'm in the restaurant business. I know what you have to do to be able to freaking have this kind of stuff. And you can't keep all this stuff fresh. Like, it's mm -hmm. not good. Instead, I'm going to sit here and be like, uh, we're the special tonight. We're going to be doing a uh, a Joel Rubichon butter whipped potato with this butter crusted uh, hard seared filet uh, with, a, with a Bordelais. Uh, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. What else do you have? That. It's going to be that. If you want something else, have a good day. But it's that's going to be the best dish ever. Instead of... 35 different things that are half ass. It's you you'll see some of these restaurants in LA and it Ridiculous. you know back in the day when these restaurants were opening up, I think a lot of people, specifically immigrants, they opened up these restaurants out of survival, right? This Agreed. is this is stuff that we have, it's not here, so I'm going to try to adapt certain foods to whatever people like. That's why you have like I'll sh I could even drive you just 6 miles from here and I'll show you a burrito Chinese sushi shop. Yeah, you know, but they've been open for like 20, 20 years. And the reason why they're still open is because it's just a neighborhood staple. Right. Well, sometimes when people open up these new restaurants, they're so afraid to create a menu that doesn't have what other people have. They don't focus on their menu. Right. It's like, don't worry about what's in Agreed. somebody else's pockets. Agreed. Figure out what you're good at, you know? Yes. And so, like you said, Cheesecake Factory is the best example. It is. When you open up it, that fucking don't even, menu. What the fuck is going on? It looks like the beginning of the Bible. Yes. Like, what the fuck? I guess. Am I doing it? Yes, literally. It's agreed. It's it's just as smooth as a toolbox going downstairs when you're reading it because you're just like, oh, that sounds good. This sounds good. And here's the thing. You screw yourself. You screw your business. I don't want people spending 18 years with the <laughs> fucking menu. Order something for the love of God and let's get rolling because now I can flip this. Like there was an interview there was an interview in a in a in a, in, um, a uh, investigation. They hired these PIs, this restaurant, Palms Restaurant, uh, trying to figure out why the hell they were losing money like they used to. They did a long story short. They they got all the tapes ten years ago to that year, and figured out that the difference and only difference that the functioning and operating costs and everything that was different is these. These people that were sitting down would always be on their phones and stuff. And it's like there was an additional like 13 to 15 minutes of time. It's like they started adding this up of like when someone had a menu instead of normally you would come in there and I'd be your server and you'd already be reading the menu because you're not having your phone. You're looking at the menu, seeing what the hell they've got going on. Then you'd be able to say, OK, I'll have this, this, this now. People sit down, they haven't even thought about touching the menu. They're going to wait around. They're going to shoot a couple texts. They're going to do this, this, this. If that does that three times, that's 13 minutes. That literally is one turn in your night. If you yeah. do that on a, on literally 30 tables, you're literally losing your ass just on the 13-minute to 15-minute flip on a cell phone. So when I used to have this uh, this soft serve shop, right? <clears throat> and mm, Love soft serve. It was mm. like I, I plan to open up another one uh, next year. First one went down because of we had some really bad business partners mm -hmm. and it was a whole ordeal. I talked about it on this podcast. We're not going to mm. get into it. But one of the things that I was very uh, particular about, we only had four flavors, one special, right? And those four flavors were, you couldn't change the toppings. And people were like, oh, your service is fast. It's because, well, we want you to have the soft serve the way we want it, right? If you want 
gummy bears. You want all this other stuff. This isn't the place for you. Like if, if I say this tastes like the strawberry shortcake ice cream bar from humor that I, that I created, this is how I'm going to serve it. If you want to add chocolate flakes or whatever, it's not going to happen. And it's not no disrespect to you. It's just this is what we're here for. Correct. You know, and we can create that fast because it's a certain experience I want to give you. You know, if you want to do it yourself, well, there's other places where you could walk in, pour your own soft serve, mm. put as much toppings as you want, and then you can walk out. Mm-hmm. So for us, it was about turnaround. It's like you can get this soft serve, order what you want. There's only four or five flavors, <laughs> you know? Right. So right. If, you, if, if I can give you something, and this is what we learned, I learned in Japan. Japan, there is no option of you taking shit out. You can't order something and say, hey, I don't want ginger on it. They would look at you like, get the fuck out of my restaurant then. Right. There isn't any of this. It's, it's the omakase thing. You need to right. trust the chef. Right. And that's why in Japan, when you go to a McDonald's, you order the food, it comes out in five seconds. There isn't, can I take out the pickles? Can I take out the ketchup? Can I take out the mustard? It is what it is. It is exactly what it is. That's what I do. I, you, you're hitting a great point on that. It's like... The thing that I tell people I'm exceptional is my palate. Being able to taste salt balanced with fat and acid. And I have an exceptional palate because I've tried to educate my palate for so long. And it's like I served someone the other night. And before they before they even have tried the steak with the sauce, with the potatoes and all this stuff, they take one bite of the potatoes and they start putting like freaking crap garbage, you know, garlic <laughs> salt on the stuff like all over it. And it's like... I wanted to grab that plate and throw it against the wall because, like, I spend so much time making it taste exactly how I wanted it to taste to you. Like, it's balanced. And I'm not one of those pretentious, like, oh, I well done steak. I'm gonna hammer. Like, if you want well done steak, I can cook you a juicy, well done steak. But like, when people are like, oh, well, different people's palates are different, and this is like, well, no, you didn't even you didn't even execute what you're supposed to do. You. You tried a little, little potatoes where you got this nice salted steak that's going to be having the carrying the potatoes through. I can't, boy, that one, that one for me, when you have people that just, <laughs> when people just try to get difficult, like they're just like, hey, listen, when you're like, I'm going to, I need the special is this, this, this. Well, can you have the no onions on it? It's like, well, the onions are in the sauce. Well, yeah, but can you take those out? <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, that's that. Then it will throw everything off. It's like, Okay, so we like the second story of the house, but the third story is no good. But the first story, if we could level that off, it's like, no, you can't take the first story out because then the second's going to fall on the floor. Like, that's how it is. Like, when you're building flavors, you can't just take something out. Also, too, it's like <clears throat> my, my thing about like foods and restaurants is you have choices of places that you can go that'll serve it however the way you want. Agreed. There are Denny's. <laughs> there are IHOPs. Yes. And, and that's perfectly Agreed. fine. Listen, I fuck with that shit all the yes. time. Like, I'll eat that. I'm a Waffle House guy, man. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Guy. Absolutely. If you, but if you go to a specific chef in a restaurant, right, they, they take time to serve it a certain way. Right. Right? There's, that's why I love food with a lot of story behind it because yes. it allows people to enjoy the food a little more. Yeah. You know, and I've talked on this podcast a little bit more about... I love Yelp because it's it's great for small business, but at the same time, sometimes it's bad right. because there are people who believe that they're experts on food without even talking to the chef, without, e- without even knowing the ingredient or anything else. So it's like, hey, how can you come in and tell somebody, like for example, I have a matcha spot, right? right. <clears throat> and we decided to try to commercialize matcha in the way that people have it in Japan. So people have this conception that matcha is only you know, you only drink it through ceremonies. So in Japan, they put in fucking Kit Kats and condoms. So this is how common it is, right? And we wanted people to understand that. So we made it more fun, um, add a lot of fruit flavors or whatever, right? <clears throat> we recently switched the name out uh, because of some legal issues. So we changed it to Jumbi. Well, there were a couple of reviews from other people who have never been to Japan, who don't even know the farm that we own. Like we, we are really particular about our matcha. Right. And somebody wrote, they changed the review from a one star to a, to a five. And they said that this new spot is so much better than the last. I was like, we just changed the name. It's the same thing. But this person came out it. Um, and like I said, you are who you are. But you wrote about it as if you're an expert about something that you don't know. Well, it's a fraud. So people are so fraud. Like the original point of what you were stating earlier is 
people think that they're all experts and like the influencer stuff and like that. And I, I'm, I'm sponsored with over 30 companies and I don't get, I don't get charged or anything because I establish a partnership and a friendship and I have a symbiotic relationship with them and there's no deadlines because they're paying me so much money. It's like, I'm going to take your product and I'm going to sell the hell out of it and I'm going to freaking do it really well. And your ROI is going to be absurd because <laughs> I, it, people trust me. If I tell them it's a good product, they know I'm not going to take bullshit. And it's like my my buddy Zach, who's Dolly Parton's photographer, uh, who is the man, we're going to do a whole video, and I'm going to show about how all these influencers, how fraudulent, how they think they're so good at cooking food and all this stuff. And I'm going to show how we can take a guy that has no idea how he's cooking, and I'm going to show how they can edit it to make him look like he is an absolute stud and knows <laughs> everything about it. This podcast is brought to you by Raycon, my friends. If you have never used Raycon earbuds, you are not blessing your ears with the sound of wonderful music and podcasts. Listen, everywhere I go, whether I'm traveling, whether I'm working out, kickboxing, biking, I take my Raycon earbuds. Why? Because the sound quality is amazing and not only that they're super light and compact a lot of these earbuds out there that are on this market right now are cool looking but they're so big the case that they come in the charging case specifically is huge raycon earbuds are light and compact and i love them and on top of that they are priced competitively at half the price as other major brands that may or may not sound either just as good or probably even worse than Raycons. I love my earbuds. Listen, that's just what I'm saying from what I'm using. I'm no professional sound engineer, but I love Raycon earbuds. I listen to music every day and I have no regrets. Raycon's offering 15% off all their products for my listeners. And here's what you got to do to go and get it. Go to buyraycon.com brain and that's it. You'll get 15% off your entire Raycon order. So feel free to grab a pair and a spare. That's 15% off at buyraycon.com slash brain. That's buyraycon.com slash brain. About how like these, some of these influencers will dye water and call it a sauce. And it's like, you don't know what it tastes like. You don't have a <laughs> clue. Like they can say anything about it and like, oh, look, it's perfectly plated and the seasoning is off and all yeah. this off. And so many people think they know so much now, more than ever. Like, it's almost like an entitlement. It's like an oh. entitlement. Like, look at me. Look at me. I'm so great. I don't. I don't understand it. it I think now, no humility. People are getting caught up in the feeling of. I want to be somebody who is an expert at something than rather being an expert, right? Because mm. being an expert actually takes mm. time. You're it, right. It's impatience. It's patience, impatience. That's right? the impatience. And so, like it. when I, You're right. <clears throat> like for example, um, I was a judge on on a food show called The Best Leftovers Ever. Right? There were a lot of great contestants, but there were a few that I felt that they were uh, Instagram chefs to right. in in the, in the worst type of way sometimes, right. right? Great people, I love them, right? But I find this a lot, even with some of my friends who who cook for me. Right? I'm not an amazing chef, but I stick to what I know, right? right. And one of the best advice that I got from um, <clears throat> a, a buddy of mine, uh, Chef Matt Ewan, mm -hmm. he goes, addition by subtraction and do what you know very well. Understand the foundation and then you can build on top of it. Love that. So, Love that. You know, we had some people coming in. They were like, I'm going to do this dish with the coddled egg. And all. I'm like, do you know how to cook a coddled egg? Right? And then I got this piece of shit right, you know right but they they saw a lot of these fun techniques right. online and they tried to imitate it. it's yeah. like well let's start with the first thing do you know how to poach an egg can you fry an egg properly can God, you scramble an you, egg properly you are my people you are my, you are my people you know you're you're hitting that you're you're dude like you're a hundred percent i'll never forget it one of my one of my good friends still today a mentor his name's danny melman and i was in culinary school at the time and he was running uh restaurants in blue ridge where i was at and he's like, I don't fucking understand what y'all are, what y'all are learning up there. He's <laughs> like, he's like, I got people that can't even fry eggs that are trying to make this compound stupid freaking. He's like, start with the basics. He's like, what are the five mother sauces? He's like, let's start there. He goes, master those five mother sauces. He goes, it'll take you a year or so to figure out how to do those. He goes, then you go on to the sub mother sauces. He's like, take the bechamel, make a mornay. He goes, work on that for a little while. He goes, oh, y'all's generation always wants to do is just freaking have it made he's like just like oh i'm gonna take this 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 and it's gonna magically work goes that's not how this works he's like it takes time patience practice i've never not listened to that i've always said that it's like understanding how to keep it between the ditches the mayonnaise the <laughs> mustard like understanding 
Like it is okay to, of course, read something. And I'm very good at like, show me a picture. I can create this. But I have the humility to be like, no, this shit, this technique is some son of a bitch. Like, this is like way out of my wheelhouse. I'm going to need to work on this before I'm able to present it. Because I'm so, I'm so prideful in my cooking because I want to make people so happy with my food. Like, I love telling a story with my food. Like, this is how we got here to here to here to here to here. And now we got this. Today, cooking with H. Wu and them, like I was cooking uh, some delicious yuca, triple fried yuca. Uh, we got uh, some fresh uh, wasabi root, got the snake or the uh, mm. shark skin, freaking grated it, made a lemon caper wasabi aioli. Dude, it slapped, it slapped, <laughs> it slapped, it assaulted me. It yeah. assaulted every person that <laughs> ate it. It had everyone in the house coming out to eat this, like just staring at each other, being like, what is going on? I was like, I'm a socier, like as I'm I'm a wheelhouse sauces. Like mm-hmm. you can say I've got this protein, I got this vegetable, I'll tell you, like, I can make this sauce for this, and it's gonna be this sauce today, man, like just absolute just punch you in the it's so good, so bouncing. Like I I never messed with Yuka until I married my Brazilian wife. So I saw her do it and then just started building it in my head. I was like, something so simple. But I was humble enough to be like, no, I'm going to watch you, even though I'm the, the professional chef, and because I, I have no idea. And as soon as I tried my wife's Yuka, hers Yuka is, mine's freaking delicious. Hers is still substantially better. <laughs> her, her Yuka is excellent. She's made it better. her whole life. Yeah. It's like, it's like, but people will, people will be like, oh yeah, I'm going to make this. And it's like, post this. And you're like, do you know how long little ma- grandma has been doing this for freaking <laughs> literal 60 years? That That's nothing like she makes. It's mm-hmm. like Gordon Ramsay did one. It was one of the funniest one. He did pad thai. He did oh, pad thai. Bro. Bro. He did pad thai. <laughs> and the guy's like, this isn't Yo, pad thai. Like, that- this is not pad thai. I shit. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, Gordon's like. No one's ever said something like this to me. It's like, it's good. It's not Pad Thai at all. This that is Pad Thai video hilarious. Had me dying yes. laughing because God. the face that he made at yeah. him, he goes, What do you think? He goes, eh? Yeah. Like, he's, yeah. He's like, This isn't Pad Thai. Like, this is, this is like, and it, that was one of those things of Gordon being like, You know what? I'm a really good chef. I should be able to just do this. It's like, No, this guy like knows like how to build this ladder of flavor up that you need to eat. You've got to go down the road. Like you had to travel the road to know where the stop signs are. Like you can't just be like up here on the view. Like, well, it looks like it's pretty good up here. Yeah. No, that's not how it works. And it's just like, like also too, uh, I think the reason why I, I also sometimes dislike a lot of like food content. And I have, I know people who do this. It's like they, they learn this recipe from like, I don't know, Bon Appetit or something, right? Mm-hmm. And they recreate it on their on their TikTok or whatever, mm-hmm. and they tell people that this is how it's made. It's like, well, first of all, we we talk about repetition. Repetition is everything, right? Agreed, and 100%. The, also, too, it's like, for example, I've eaten Ethiopian food maybe five or six times. Najir bread? Yeah. Oh, oh I can't God. recreate the food because no. I haven't made it. I haven't eaten it enough. Agreed. I Agreed. don't know what's in it yet. Correct. You know what I mean? But Correct. if you give me a Korean dish, I've grown up with it. And this is what I found out when I started cooking myself at home was mm-hmm. there's a reason why I couldn't cook Italian food well. I didn't grow up eating it a lot. Right. But there's a reason why. You don't why know the nuances. Exactly. You've not traveled the fucking road. How the fuck <laughs> are you supposed to know where everything's located if you're not from the village? Exactly. So like when I started cooking Korean food, I'm like, my Korean food is substantially better because I've developed 30 years of a palate with Correct. this food. So I understand what I can taste for and what I yes. can't. And so when uh, sometimes too, people always focus on a lot of the aesthetics, which I agree, you eat with your eyes first. I understand that concept. However, it still has to taste good. Agreed. <laughs> I mean, 100%. It needs to fucking taste Ag- good. Agreed. I, well, I mean, they say you eat with your eyes first and stuff. But it's like a lot of times, like I eat with my hands yeah. because whenever you're getting the senses, like whenever you have a fork, you're taking it away. Like you can smell it. You can look, you can do this. You need to feel it. Like your body reacts when you pick up things. That's why it's changed a lot of my food. Like I eat exponentially more food with my hands. When I went to India, it kind of changed the whole thing. But before then I still ate with my hands. Yeah. Getting your senses, getting things rolling. It's like, you're getting a muscle memory to the food. You're getting a relationship closer. You're literally swaddling up literally the food. But I look at it as like how you said the Korean thing is like 
I look at it as literally like your communal village. Like I literally have eaten in this place so long. I know all the back roads. I know where everything is. I know what I need to see. When you drop off at a place that your palate's uneducated in, it's literally like you're a tourist. You don't know what's good. You don't know where you're going with it. You don't know what's right, what's wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I think this is delicious. Like Gordon's the prime example. It probably tasted good as hell. Like Mm -hmm. it probably was delicious. Not pad thai, yeah. <laughs> because it's like you didn't put this two yeah. or three things in that anybody mm-hmm. that's done this for thirty years would know. Oh, you should have put the fish paste in here. This should have put this in there. That's the prime example. And so many people want like instant gratification, and it's like I don't understand why people try to do other things that other people are doing, which is a big trend now, and just like like the food trends and stuff. And it's like. Why don't what happened to the classics? Like yeah. what happened to the shit that we've been like when you go to India and people have been eating this food for five thousand years? <laughs> yeah. It's like you don't mess with it. There was a there was a uh, Dino or Gino, the thing that uh, Gordon Ramsay, Gino, and the Frenchman. There's like three of them. Mm. They go traveling around. Gino's an Italian guy. I, I think his name is Gino uh, or Dino. I think his name is Dad Gum Dino. I can't remember. Yeah, some uh, Italian guy. <laughs> yeah, some Italian guy. He was on a cooking show, a British cooking show, and this woman starts talking about how she puts mushrooms and sour cream in this in this dish, which this clearly was, was like bolognese or something. Yeah. She's like, I just love to do this. This is like, why? And he just he just starts freaking out and going an Italian rant. He's yeah. like, this is what's wrong with this freaking country. <laughs> he's like, about he's, the pasta. He, yeah, he's like, this is what's wrong with it. He's like, you have a dish we've been doing so long. And he goes, and I said, I'm going to change it. He's like, yeah. you just want to change everything. Change everything. He goes, it works. It's a classic. You don't have to change it. You don't need to put your spin on it. Just eat it the way that it's supposed to be eaten. Like, whenever mm-hmm. you're doing your own thing, it's like, Oh, look, these people that have been doing this for thousands of years are wrong. Yeah. Let's just do this. And, and listen, I, I like innovation, but there's like certain there's things difference, like though. With, with like Italian food, right? For example, I, I had carbonara for the longest time, right? Mm-hmm. And what I mean by for the longest time is a lot of these pots that used uh, cream and bacon in it. I was like, oh, this is good. And then I had real carbonara well, with nice just the starch egg, from the water, yes. the egg, Parmesan cheese, yes. guanciale, or sometimes like prosciutto, whatever yes. they wanted, right? And I was like, this is a different experience. And I didn't understand decadence. why they changed it. Decadence. Yeah. The decadence of carbonara. It was one of my favorite dishes. The cream wasn't necessary. No. You, you didn't have to use bacon at all. No. And you didn't have to add parsley. You didn't need any of this stuff. And so when I ate it, I'm like, when I, when I thought about that was, Why? Right, because the original carbonara is also cheaper to make than the one with the cream. So why was the cream added? And so that's that's where I understand where that's not innovation. You're just kind of you're kind of fucking that one up a little bit. Hundred percent, it's easier. It's 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 it, that's such an easy dish. But when you add cream, cream, cream is such a, a foolproof thing. When you have fat on things, it makes mm. things the emulsification is so oh, much easier. So you put the it. cream in there. And you can just put the cream, flip around the egg, and you could bust it. Yeah, exactly. So that would be my guess is they put the cream in there to freaking just stabilize it a little Absolutely. more. Absolutely. Got you, just got you. It. I remember just like when I would watch all these videos, there's this guy, his, his, his YouTube is called Vincenzo's Plate, an um, Italian chef. And he just critiques uh, other major chefs who make Italian food. Right. And to me, it's just hilarious. The, it's just fucking funny because of how he freaks out. Right. So he also critiqued. Um, Gordon Ramsay's carbonara. Really? He added cream and peas and bacon. And he was like, what the fuck what are you good? doing? Right. This yeah. is not even close. This yeah. is some freaking Alanoa. Like, what is this? <laughs> just, Jesus. just watching him, watching his Italian spirit break made me die laughing. His Italian spirit break. Yeah. His heart just crumbles. It was just fucking like shattering as he watched somebody bastardize one of his favorite dishes. And I, I think what that. I really liked about Italian food when I was trying to uh, learn how to cook some stuff here and there, and I buy a lot of like chef books mm-hmm. and I follow other people, was just um, understanding how simple it was. There yes. was there's not a lot of a variation in the ingredients. It's very simple, but it's high quality shit. So like just the difference between canned tomatoes and then San Marzano tomatoes. 
Uh, yes, and, most, and then you have to find, then you have to see the difference between real San Marzano and fake San Marzano <laughs> tomatoes. If you like, the, if you get real San Marzano on the hillside, there is a ginormous difference in flavor. It's crazy how much uh, more sweeter they are. Yes, right. And it's yes. not like me just saying uh, you could faintly taste it. It yeah. tastes substantially substantially different. better. Yeah. It's, it's like having really Parmesan Reggiano, and instead of literally having Parmesan, yeah, it's like there's a difference here. Yeah. Like it has to be from that region, or it's no good, and it's got to be stamped and. Rest. But no, I, uh, I I'm right there with you, man. Like uh, on all the food, on all like the 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 Italians. I have a great friend, uh, Helena. Been friends with her for years. She's probably the most talented pizza pizza tora uh, on the planet. Um, she did a pizza class with me last week, and we only had like four ingredients making this nepalese uh pizza dough and i'm thinking like this is it hmm. like this the stuff that you're making is four ingredients like what the hell i thought there was gonna be this and this and this and this there's four ingredients and i'm like my god like the italians just like this is simple stuff and it's just done right it's the it's like literally the the ultimate kiss mentality keep it simple stupid yeah, like yeah, it is yeah, yeah. it is that cooking like and like going to india you have this food that is so simple yet so complex. Like it's like there's 13 different spices in here, and it's like it was so, the simplicity. These people don't even think a thing about it. But like if you tried to jump in on that, it <laughs> yeah, would be yeah. an absolute train wreck. Like they're like, oh, it's this, 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 this. It's just like one of this, one of this, one of this, one. It's like oh, it's a simple ingredients. Like yeah, but there's like 45. Like what the heck. Indian food is so much about layering, too. Italian is no layering. Mm -hmm. I don't taste Italian food as a layering kind of food. Mm. Like, I don't ever eat, and I'm like, man, the layering here is just substantial. There's, like, there's the heat, and then there's the cream. There's, like, if I get, like, a good, you know, a good Diablo sauce or something like that, some kind of a nice spicy sauce, then I start to kind of get a layering. But for me, Italian food is not... Is not a super layering type of food. Like if you have some like ridiculous, some incredible Korean food, some incredible Chinese food, some incredible, there's so many different textural levels and we're all over the place. You can have like cold rita in, over here and then you're going over to this soft, fluffy, yeah. like the textures are back and forth. Italians like, I know it's coming at me. Like mm -hmm. I can stare at this, and my eyes can immediately tell me what happens. It's not an adventure for me. Mm -hmm. Like when I'm when I'm looking mm -hmm. at some Korean stuff, I'm like, Koreans, my gosh, like they they eat everything. Like it is it is such a respect to everything kind of culture. Indian, Chinese, same thing. So it's like it's such an adventure. Like I'm eating this little thing. Oh, this is a tripe stew. I'm going to eat this kind of texture on this. Italian oh, you food. you you go yeah, in, huh? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So for me, for me, Italian food, love Italian food. One of my favorite things. I love the elegance of how simple it is, but it's such. It's one of those things that is so different than like what I love to eat. I love adventurous cooking. Like Northern Thai food is so fun for me because it's Yo, got. Have you been to Thai because, town in LA? No, Bro. because of that. Because like the 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 nice lime, like the citrus in it, and hey. you get that tang and the pop and the crunch. How They're just how long are you here for? I got to tomorrow at ten o'clock. Oh my, okay. The whole reason I'm out here is literally to do this podcast in the drive. -in. That's it. That's literally the only reason I'm here. Ten o'clock. What nighttime? At night. Okay. I got to take you to, uh, we got to go to Thai Town. There's, oh, a, there's a couple of spots that I really, really fucking enjoy. It's Pa Or Noodle. They specific, they specialize specifically only in like noodle soups. They oh, also, boy. they have a few oh, other boy. stuff, right? Oh boy. You know what I mean? Like, uh, oh, and there's boy. also this spot next to it called a pork belly gang, but it's Thai as fuck, right? I they love have Thai. God. Thai food. I love it. Here's the thing it's about so Thai good. food, right? Like when I had Thai food out in Sacramento, right? There's a lot of Thai spots, but they're very Americanized Thai. And then you go to Thai town and it's a completely different experience. Right. They don't really hold back for the American palate. They right. go, this is Thai food like I had it. Right. It's going to smack you in the fucking face. Right. Absolutely. We're, we're going to take you salty. We're going to go sweet. Yes. We're going to go sour. We're going to go savory. Umami. <laughs> just, yeah, just, and this is where it's going to be at, absolutely. right? Absolutely. That's what I want. I literally get, a, I want to get assaulted when I eat the food. Like I want, <laughs> I want, I want like ninjas of flavor coming at me and like hitting me in the face. That's what I want Thai food. Like Thai is something that I literally get excited for impact like yeah. i want good there's a restaurant 
Here's the thing. There's a great restaurant in New York. It's a one Michelin star. It's called Som Tom. Okay. Uh, and we all, all the master chef, me and my buddies, the master buds, Nick, Sherry, Evan, Sam, Suba, um, we went there and it was like fifty five dollars. I mean, I ate my ass off. I ate my ass off. It was only like fifty five bucks a person. I was like, "We've been eating for an hour and a half here. Like, I just what? It's only fifty five. I only owe you fifty five bucks. Yeah, it's only like three hundred something dollars for the six. And then, like, I'm talking. It's a Michelin star. I'm talking everything I could eat. I mean, pitching like Nolan Ryan, just howitzer. <laughs> And I, and I could not get the bill that high. And it was the most delicious, fresh, so fresh, so fresh. This is why, like, rest in peace, rest in peace, like, John, Jonathan Gold. Like, mm. he really shed a lot of light onto these mom and pop stores, right? Mm -hmm. Because the Michelin star was given to a lot of these restaurants that did, you know, molecular gastronomy. Right. They had all this. But there was like, well, hold on a second. What about these restaurants right. here? These mom and pop places. Because I guarantee you, you guys wouldn't be able to replicate their food. Right. Agreed. And so he started giving it to these taco trucks, his Jonathan Gold Star. And it it really allowed people to see how great food can be outside of the setting that you're sitting in. Agreed. Right. Because food is like because you haven't even gone out to East L.A. to these taco trucks. Right. Like mm. there's mm -mm. like you. It would be impossible to eat your way through L.A. Like it's like in, right. in a matter of like. Well, that's what I told you. That's what I said. Buford Farmer's Market, bro. <laughs> like we got two miles of hell. Like you are. I mean, I've got two miles. You have Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. You have Rhode Island. Yeah. Just, you have the whole state of Rhode Island. Like the size yeah. of Rhode Island is your food place. Mm -hmm. Like it's absurd the amount of different, the variety of food that you when, have. When you're here. So like when people come here too, like a lot of my friends who are out of town, mm -hmm. there's. There's a lot of restaurants that people want to try, but I, I can never recommend them the, uh, the I call them like the uh, the West Hollywood restaurants, right? Because right? I've eaten there before and they're really good, but I like looking for like the, the hole in the wall spots, right? Oh, right? That's, that's me, yes. So, you know, that's the restaurants that I want to show them. Like my buddy Vince and I, we literally did like taco crawls every fucking week for a year taco just to crawls, find- that sounds fantastic. <laughs> Dude, that sounds fantastic. You know- uh, That'd one be of my called gurney crawl. I would need a gurney after that, <laughs> oh, probably to me. wheel me around. I had a friend. I have a friend. Her name is Friesish out in New York. And whenever she comes here, I'm like, "Well, let's take you on that taco crawl." And I take her to my favorite spots in East LA. And it's it's hard to replicate that, right? They there's this place called uh, Tacos Ibiria La Unica, and they do birria tacos. Which is, you know, stewed. Oh, yeah, no, you know, I, you took, know, I, cook, I cook the shit out of some Rio tacos. Yeah. I make some ridiculous ones, some <laughs> stupid good ones. Goat. I yeah. make it with goat. So goat. you go to like Ibiria La Unica, and then right around the corner is Marisco's Jalisco. They do these shrimp tacos Gosh. dorados, right? Jesus Christ. And then, then at 5 p.m. at night, you'll go to the oh Al Carbon tacos. God, I'm <laughs> You know what like I mean? My mom's texting. I'm a half Texan, so tacos have been a big part of my <laughs> life. Like, yeah, I've been eating the amount of tacos that I've been <laughs> We have a spot that God, only God, thank you, the, thank you, God, for this. That we have this Mexican spot. It's Los Dos Hermanas. And uh, all women, 100% ran by women, little grocery store. And my town is like 20,000 people is in the county. In the town, there's 1,500. In my little town, it's 500. Like, there's not any good really good ethnic restaurants at all the chinese restaurant joke but this restaurant makes like the best most authentic mexican food that you can get i mean like i'm very i'm a stickler for real authentic but we're talking it can't get more authentic we're talking we're talking dollar 25 little tacos we're talking esquite elote world-class enchiladas homemade sauces and it's cheap. You can get a, a cup of esquite for $2. Oh, shit. You can get a tostada for $2. And the tostada is this big. It is the best deal in town. I tell everyone, if anyone asks me, because I get asked all the time, mm -hmm. where do I eat? That's right. $2 tostada. Chorizo, bean, cheese, guacamole, three slices of avocado, $2. Yeah, it I, is, gotta, I gotta take it. I, to I, like a wood like, chipper, wood just yeah. just gulp, gulp, gulp. I mean, dude, all day they are so nice, they are so kind. I tip them a hundred percent. It's one of the few restaurants that I tip a hundred percent. I you tip a hundred percent. I tip a hundred percent. Like if my bill is twenty dollars, it's forty dollars. Yeah, I just we, give the shit out of money to them because I'm like, please God, just stay open. Because I've been here my whole life, and there's just sucks. And like, I if I want good food, I gotta cook it, and I love yeah. cooking. 
But it's like, I love that me and my dad, my dad just retired uh, in December. I love that my dad, like, hey, let's go get some lunch. And I can go to a spot that I'm, in, I'm getting treated like family. They love me. They, they give me, they give me food instantly like it's like a magic show it's like yeah. david copperfield trick without the touching but i mean mm -hmm. it's it's uh, i am a like with tacos man like i could beat kobayashi on like five okay, get I'll, five down I'm like get five down a, I, I will like, take get five you to, down quickly like just i just gone i'm gonna take you to a taco crawl we're gonna go like straight up and alive we'll do like my favorite fish taco spots right We'll definitely get dessert at uh, one of my favorite like churro spots. I'm a I'm a sugar addict, so I can definitely okay, deal this, with, with like dessert. Like Jalisco churros are a little different, you I know what eat, I mean? They're, I can eat the shit out of them. You know, because like typically when you have a churro, right? Like it's crispy on the right. outside. You have the cinnamon right. sugar, cinnamon and sugar. That's great. Right. But Jalisco chul uh, churros are a little different in the sense that they're a, a little um, creamy on the inside still. So a little different. And it's my favorite. That and sounds they, delicious, right? And they had their uh, goat's milk caramel on top of it. <laughs> it's it's different dude so when you I'm have all in for that yeah uh yes and then we'll go to mariscos jalisco they have their tacos dorados right there <sighs> they have their agua chile it's super fucking good spicy as shit really good though what about indian people what about indian food in la is there any of that there is i mean there's i didn't even think about that because i'm like we've i've gone to little tokyo i went to a little korea town i went but like it hit me i was like there's i've not seen any indian there there, there is but they're in like different pockets there's uh, like indians and indian and nepalese yes right so there's a there's a few spots big pockets or just not just not, kinda, that not big. big here i can show you my favorite spot it's literally a market yeah <laughs> and then there's food in the back yeah and it's so delicious fucking good it, dude i don't know understand it's very simple for me i'm like why i think truly indian food is the best food on the planet. like they've literally been done it, doing it longer than anybody they've literally well, been cooking I'll, longer i'll tell people this too like i I've, I've said this before if i ever wanted to become vegetarian i'm eating indian food all no day. question because they don't ever back they say down non meat. they say non-meat in india they say <laughs> non-meat is what they say it's like you want non-meat they're like yeah i'll take a non-meat i mean i'm I'm a, a plant-based guy that changed. I was a carnivore to plant-based, but like when I'm on vacation and I want to eat good food, I want to eat some yeah. stuff. But I do plant-based because I just feel exponentially better. That's mm -hmm. the thing that people always kind of mess up on is like, I choose to do it because my, my, you feel my good. I'm a war machine with it. Like, dude, I can, the, the fluidity of thought process, my anxiety, I suffer from immense depression, immense de anxiety, and you never know unless I said it, because I just battled through it, but one of the best things I've ever done on treatment-wise was literally doing plant-based. Like, I didn't feel like I wanted to jump off a bridge every day being mm -hmm. on plant-based. It's like, when I went full meat, get terrible thoughts, and it's like, I'm a guy that wouldn't want it. Like, I've done all this diets, all this stuff. Plant based was something that when I do it, like I just feel so much better. But I still love like getting some mozzarella, frying it up a little yeah, truffle yeah, yeah, yeah. salt, like just some little here and there, like an ice cream scoop, you know? But I know that I'm going to pay the piper because of it. I know yeah, that yeah, I'm going to yeah. feel expert. Yeah, dude, if I eat a bowl of cereal, and I've been plant based for sure, and as soon as I eat a bowl of cereal, it is, it, it literally feels like I'm having a demon eat my stomach wow. it just yeah instantly like dairy hurts so, so. before you went plant place how, how long were you dealing with like these thoughts and emotions with like depression and oh dude i've had i've had i've had i've had mental health issues since i was a, since i was a kid i was molested when i was five and didn't tell anybody until i was like 27 years Holy old shit. And like just kind of built this this I don't know this what I was I I the man that I am it was because of what happened and the way I kind of did like night and shining armor always watching over people not letting anyone ever mess with anybody it's like what well, if I see anybody messing with anybody else I'm gonna step in if I see a woman getting touched by a man we have a problem like and like. I had so many, so much anger, so much pain. I turned to sugar, so I was always addicted to sugar. I got up to like 360 pounds. Um, I never was a victim, never told anybody, never said this is why I'm feeling this way, this is why this. I just kept to myself, even though like every day, knowing how blessed I was, knowing how good my life was, still having like, well, the world would be better if you jump off this bridge like this. The world would be better if you got off and being like having to fight yourself 
every single day for no reason and having to deal with that every day um, and not giving it to anybody else. So for me and having the anxiety that I had got to the point of just being like enough's enough. Like I'm yeah. crippled. Like, so I've got to do something different. Like I've got to try something else. So when I went plant-based, I did it when I was in the Bahamas uh, when everyone was just, it was such a mess after Dorian, it was just a literal war zone. I was like, you know what? This is a great freaking time. I've got tons of vegetables, cans <laughs> of beans. I was like, this is a great time. So I went plant-based, uh, for two weeks. It was so hard, but then all of a sudden I just started getting everything in my life aspect wise just stamina, endurance, vascularity, mental clarity, reflexes. I had one time something fell out of the truck, the septic truck, so I do septic. And I remember I flipped my arm behind my back and caught it without even looking. And like it just my body reacted and driving and everything. And I started doing the research and trying to figure it out and it made perfect sense. It's like having the animal fats and animal proteins in your body, just think of it just as a as a as a slowing down process of your blood, your fluidity, your neurological bridgeways are slowed down and congested with animal fat. So when you don't have those animal fats, the fluidity of neurons, everything goes much better, which is I, I did a whole thesis 13 years ago on CBDs and how they cured cancer and all this. And I thought I was a loon. Boy, was I freaking right about everything that's happened about THC and legalization. How it's going to be a billion dollar industry and all that. Doing stacking plant base while stacking with THC and CBD have made me where at 34 years old, I am in the best shape of my life. And within, I'm about 15 pounds away from my total goal mm. of where I want to be. And it's like the, the, the key to what I'm speaking on is you cannot fix the outside machine if you don't have the inside machine working. I had to fix my brain first before I tried to fix my body. And I always tried to just work on my body and just failed losing weight, failed losing weight, failed like constantly fucking like idiot, like God fucking shit. Like I do this, 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 I get so fucking close and then I just fail. It's like, fuck. So that stacks it back on. So instead this time I'm like, fuck, I'm going to rewrite my computer. I'm going to get my programming. I still recognize how, how I'm so blessed, but I'm going to work on my mental health. And once I got my mental health, Everything else has fallen into place. Everything else in my body has fallen into place. So now that I've got my brain right, I'm able to start moving forward. I still struggle every day with immense anxiety, but you have a choice. Either you're going to let it affect you or you're going to fucking do your best. It's like, yeah. all I can do is my best. Like, because sometimes you don't want to get out of bed. Sometimes you're just like, God, fuck, like a heart attack. Like, I've been trying to tell people this. For the, so, I mean, this is the hard part with this conversation when people hear stuff like this, right? Because I, I, I lost uh, 70 pounds. Mm. So uh, I just counted my calories. That's all mm. I did. I was like, okay, I'm just going to stop eating so much. Right. <laughs> you know, and yes. I pulled back. Put, this, put, the, but, hamburger down, put <laughs> the hamburger down. Put the hamburger down. Like, did you have to yeah. eat 8,000 calories? Yes. Probably not. Probably not. You know? mm. So like, you know, and a big part of it probably was because of the anxiety issues that I had. Right. Mm. And you, you hit on a point that I think a lot of people don't want to hear because they have this defeatist mentality, right? It's, when I tell people I have anxiety, people think, oh, you don't have my anxiety. I was like, listen, I have anxiety to the point, by the way, I'm gonna share this right now, I didn't renew my fucking DMV, my license for a fucking year because I was too anxious to go inside the DMV because it was freaking me out. Yeah. I just renewed it uh, last week after yeah, a year. It happens. You know, and so when I tell people I have anxiety, I do. The, the difference between me and you is that I tried to face it head on. You know, the, 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 the license thing just happened to work with the pandemic because I wasn't driving anywhere. So I'm like, fuck it. Right, right? right. But I do stand up and I deal with anxiety all the time. And I keep telling people that you have this, you have an option. And that's the beautiful thing, right? Maybe not so depression also too. I don't like, I haven't felt depression before, but anxiety, crippling anxiety has been something that I have to deal with on a daily. And it's something that I have to learn how to face, right? Because I can sit in my room and just wallow in self-defeat or I could say, I have this issue, but I have to face it. If Agreed. not, then I can't do anything about it. And Absolutely. so I think nowadays with a lot of people, they just want to 
pinpoint what's wrong with them and just accept it. You can't accept it. Agreed, one hundred percent. That's what I'm saying. You can. You've got to keep moving forward. What you said about the DMV hit hit home with me because, like, like a bill. I always pay my bill. It's got incredible credit and stuff. But there's sometimes there's like like pay your bill no. It's like no, I don't want to. It's like pay your bill no. It's like what the fuck is going on here? Like I'm go I need to pay this yeah, bill. Duh, like I know exactly what, what you're talking like, about. What the f just pay the goddamn bill no? Like I'm like no, I'm not doing this. Like I have it. Nope, I'm not doing it. Not doing yeah, it at all. Yep, like yep. like going to the DMV is like just go to the fucking DMV. Like why won't you? Like I know I need to go. And you're like having this conversation with yourself. Like I'm not insane. Like move your ass i've been there so many times what's bad is when that happens and then you're just like okay with it like you said just settle with it. like okay well pinpoint it here there it is like no you need to evolve you need yeah. to figure out what the fuck is going on why is this causing this and move on what the problem is with anxiety stacked on depression is is that you get into this paradox where you mm. just can't fucking move like it is like the anxiety sinks you and then the depression just tombstones you. It's like you just get stacked on stacked on stack. So for me, having depression, like anxiety was something that I could start to see coming on. Like I could see it starting to build its thing up. Depression would just be making no sense. Depression for me, never. Like, anal and like for me, depression makes no fucking sense when you analyze that you're so blessed and that everything is good. But anxiety, still, like, it is a son of a bitch. Like, yeah. that son of a bitch, like, no logic. Like, there, yeah. it just it just starts building up. You're like, I'm good. I'm no, It still just keeps going. And depression just has, I feel like depression is just this thing that's just power bombs. And, like, you just yeah, can't yeah. see it coming. And it just drops on you. And, and you like, can't no figure matter, out the why. You can't figure ever out the why. Like, it. that's what I think the biggest thing about why suicide is so high is that you can't figure out and get to the core problem of what the fuck is going on with depression. Anxiety, you can see kind of what the fuck is going on here. Like, why am I getting upset about going to the DMV? This is not a fucking big deal. This is a blessing that I can get in my car, drive to the DMV, make my life easier by having this, this license on time so it's not expired. Why can't you do that? Anxiety, you're like anxiety. Okay, good. Depression. There would be no you fucking double cookie fuck. crabs. You're just getting <laughs> double fuck. You don't know what the fuck. Like, it, I mean, so for me, it's like being open and honest. Being a giant six foot seven white guy that never had anybody fucking with them on being a racist or anything like that. I looked at it as my job of being open and honest about it and showing my my. Power is showing empathy. I'm able to feel people's energy and be able to take their pain and be able to pile it on my shoulders and be able to open them up to a different way that they're like, why am I able to talk to this guy about this? Because I give a shit. I actually yeah. care. I'm not, I'm not asking you a question unless I really want to know what's going on with you. Like, tell me what's popping. And I've seen that that's helped people so much with anxiety because it slows the process down of like, what the fuck is happening? It's like, why are you freaking out? Well, I just, I got this, 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 this. Okay, well, let's break down the rest of the day. You got eight hours. So yeah. you got eight hours. How long do you think that'll take? Well, three. Okay, well, listen, you can either freak out right now for three hours or whatever, not get it done. And then you're going to be, you know, whatever, just be in the same spot with five hours left in the day or you can hammer this out. The rest of the day is just copacetic. Everybody's <laughs> fine. You, everything's done and you move on. I said, this is so easy. Like, let's just break this down. You get it done. You know, you got to get it done or you literally still got to get it done and you feel like shit because you just keep procrastinating and not get your head out of your ass. It's you know, like, you know, what's interesting too. Like I, I, what I started finding out when I was having conversations with people who were dealing with anxiety was I found out there's two types of people. There's people who identify their anxiety and they use it as a crutch, or there's the second person who identifies it and it's like, now I know how to fix this. Correct. And Agreed. so I, the first time I realized I had anxiety, because I just never knew what the shit was. I just kind of considered, I'm just a bitch. You right. know, that's how I would talk to I, myself. Yeah, decade. I felt like that for like that. I was like, why am I crying? Yeah. Like, what the fuck is, I'm not pregnant? Yeah. Like, the hell is happening here? Trust me, yes. Yeah, and so it was just a little quick moment that I had with my fiance, and we moved into this apartment out in Glendale. And I think you and I had the same personality. I'm not sure if you feel this way, but 
we tend to want to learn every in and out about something b- because of our anxiety. 100%. Like, so, 100%. Because I don't want to not know what the Correct. fuck I'm talking about. I don't want about. surprises. I don't exactly. want surprises ever. I so, want to be able to open my mouth and it's going. Let it rip. Exactly. 100%. So my friend, he, they realized it too. They were like, we were walking around and we're walking around South Pasadena. And I'm telling them all this information about the air. Like, why do you know this shit? And I was like, it's because of my anxiety. Like, I feel like I have to be knowledgeable about shit in case of conversation or whatever the fuck that it is. Do you have fallout? Do you have fallout plans about pretty much a, like, like a billion different situations? Oh, 100%. I, have, I will tell, I will like, if this happens, <laughs> this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to go this, 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 like, no, we're on a plane. It's like, yeah, well, listen, if a fucking terrorist mm-hmm. is on the right side of the fucking plane in the front part of this, this is what you need to do. You need to go to the far back right bathroom. Like, Always have some people think it's crazy. Like we have nothing better to do except to try to live a functional life. And yeah. if we think there's a probability that that could be ended, let's just have a plan to just you know circle navigate that a little bit. That's how it is. It's like having like why not having getting you know a speeding ticket? I think like if I was a cop, where the hell would the cop be? It's like it gives me anxiety thinking that I'm driving really fast and there's a cop here. What do I do? I think about if I was a cop, where would I be? I don't get speeding tickets. It's, it's the, like it's the overthinking thing. And, uh, yes. the, and the crazy but thing is, I find peace in that. It's like my ADHD <laughs> brain by working in the overdrive, I get actually more peace than if it just calmed down and didn't think about anything. You know what's so funny? Because like, like I was telling you, so when I was with my fiance in Glendale, it's when we moved in, and I didn't plan out by measuring out the space between the cabinetry and some of my equipment stuff if it would fit in the room, and I didn't do that ahead of time. And so when we were trying to move it in. I started freaking the fuck out. I started getting angry. I was cursing and stuff. She looked at me. She goes, what are you doing? I'm like, this is not going to fucking work. This is shit. And she's like, what? Hold, hold on for a second. We're going to walk outside. Let's take a breath. I was like, no, this shit's not going to fucking work. This is stupid. And I was like, she looked at me. She goes, I don't understand. The, you're in the same dude. Yeah, I'm like, wait, hold on. What is this? And I was like, oh, I think I have anxiety issues. I've been dealing with this shit my whole life. And then she was the pointed out, one that pointed it out how it doesn't make sense. Like, this is weird. But then on the flip side, I bet on some fucking really strong, challenging shit that other people are losing your shit, you're looking at them like, what the fuck are you like? Just be calm, right? Like, yeah, yeah. like what the fuck are you doing? Like, like, this, this is easy. Like, yeah. what is going on here? But then on this thing, you're like, not the cool, not this alpha. You're going beta. I do the same thing. Like, then I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, get you. This is nothing. Like, this is nothing. You're freaking out over nothing. And my wife does the same thing. She's like, no, calm down. I'm like, no, this is the end of the world. <laughs> She's like, that, no, it's not. What are you, what are you, what are you yelling for? Like, yeah. God, son of a bitch. That's just this, this, this. She's like, no, it's not. What am I doing? Calm down. It's like, like that mentality of certain things that we yes. accept and choose not to accept, yes. right? So yes. one, of, one of the things is like I tend to, for some reason, no matter what car I'm in, somebody fucking hits me. But because I've accepted the reality that somebody's going to hit me, I, I'm always cool about shit. Agreed. I'm like, Same yeah, here. It's, it's whatever. It's Same fine. We'll, we'll go through this, this, and this. I know how to deal with the situation. It's fine. But then I can't fit a cabinet into a room and I'm freaking the yes. fuck out. Yes. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't. But I've been able, because I've been able to recognize what it is, now when I have the episode, I can be like, in the middle of it, say, hey, you're being unreasonable. This Agreed. is an anxiety attack. Take a step outside, relax. Agreed. You know, and I think if I didn't do that, I wouldn't have been able to do it before because I just didn't know what the fuck was going but on. My dad says that. You, you've got a good point. My dad is one of the smartest people I've ever met. And I'm sure everyone's like, my dad, but my dad's <laughs> really a special, special guy. And he's like it doesn't cost you anything to just stop and step back mm. that life is not not life is not in that mere second but he goes you can make a split second decision that that will cost you your life he's like just step mm. back it doesn't cost anything just it does there's no reason like if you feel like something like stop reassess and move on he's like you're brilliant use your brain like if it doesn't make sense stop pause a minute I, I believe people rush into things so quickly nowadays because, like, we go back to the original point of not being patient at all. And it's just like, 
my anxiety, my anxiety now I am able to like step back a little bit instead of like not being able to get the cabinet or like I fucking cut this freaking thing perfect and it doesn't fit. And it's like I measured it right. And then God <laughs> forbid if somebody else is brave enough to hop in here to get into this shit show and then they're giving me misinformation that's making my life more difficult. It's like, yeah, now, shut the fuck exactly. Up. <laughs> now we're just like, you are just here. We don't need to go to here. We need to go to here. Yeah. So like, so for me, being being a person, I think the key really to and I believe this wholeheartedly that what has helped me the most with my anxiety is self-awareness. Mm. Having self-awareness on understanding where I'm fucking up, where I'm ex- where 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 are my cores that I'm going for, and then getting a game plan for those so they don't happen. I used to not have any analytics on. I'd have the plan of like if these are things are happening. Yeah. Never have any analytics about getting me mad. Like if this step one's happening, we need to go to this. If this is happening, go to this. Now I'm like kind of like I have a checklist on how to get not so hot, not yeah. so analytically fucked on myself where I'm just throwing all this stuff, energy all over the place, just like a fire hose all over the place, having controlled thought. It's the idea of taking responsibility. Correct. The, the taking responsibility part is hard for a lot of people. It's yes. hard for me too, but we have to because yes. then everything is just out of our control. And then, then we get into the cycle of blaming everybody else for our problems. That's is that just society? <laughs> Did you just say that's society? That's society in a nutshell. That's yeah. hard going down like the fucking Hindenburg. Is no yeah. one takes any responsibility. You, you see it on Twitter. Nobody has any responsibility. Yeah. Nobody takes any any responsibility. None. It, yeah. it is one of the biggest problems with the world right now. Is everyone parlays it off onto somebody else? They're like, okay, you had this, this. Let's go this way. Uh, it wasn't me. It wasn't it. It's Everyone thinks they're a fucking professional. Everybody thinks they're way better than they are. Everyone thinks they're owed everything. Yes. Everyone's so entitled. So yeah. you have these entitled people that have these false senses of talent. It's just delusion. Like where we're living, and that's why I tell all my friends, like the cream's gonna rise to the top. Don't worry, don't you worry about your numbers and your followers. Like if you're good, it's gonna be blatantly obvious. Like I, for me. I'm, I'm not educated. I went to college for five years, didn't finish. I uh, went to culinary school, blazed through four, Hilarious. 4.0. Five years of college, didn't yeah, finish. Didn't finish. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> didn't do it. Yeah, you know, people was like, I feel that I can walk in any room on this planet and be able to talk to any person on the planet. And for me, it's like moving and grooving now in this world. I am so for the long game and I've spent my whole life doing long games that I'm such a patient person. And the only thing that can screw that patience up is myself. Like, yeah. and I need to have the awareness enough to be able Personal to understand exactly yeah. to be like, just stay to the course, like Nick Saban, trust the process, stick to the course. And like, if I'm able to, if I'm able to just keep the head down, keep on going, believe in the process and keep going and be patient enough then whatever I really want to achieve should be able to be achieved. Like people, Donald Trump became president of the United States. Anything is possible. <laughs> anything, yeah. anything, like yeah. any, anything, anything, any, you, th- anything. You can do any job. I used to say, no, that's ridiculous. Like if you're not born a six foot nine, you know, giant, powerful person, you, you know what? You maybe could, but something could happen because anything's possible. Now, Donald Trump was president. That's the only thing that Donald Trump did good as president is literally, you could say you can be anything, anything. <laughs> you want to be anymore. That's the only advantage. I like, I like how you talk about patience too. And um, we all get caught in this trope where we want instant gratification. Patience is very, very important because patience is also important for growth, right? Everything that comes hard is always better at the end. Right? 100%. One of my favorite, like, and I just want, I don't want to wrap it back up to the food stuff too. Like my favorite chefs that I've eaten from are people who have done their craft for so fucking yes. long. I was waiting for Adam Perry Lane to open up a restaurant for right. the longest time, right. you know, because... I just remember he did pop-ups in LA right. or wherever he was at and people consider him a master smoker and um, you know right. I I went and I ate one of his beef ribs and I'm like what the fuck did I just eat right. <laughs> you know right. you know right. and I've been to Texas I've I've, right. I've been to all the famous spots right. and they're delicious too and then Adam Perry Lang's I was like this is something different what is this shit 
you know and i was like oh he's a master of his craft and what he does right there's a reason why his steaks always look the way that he does there's a reason why he could talk about cuts of beef where it comes from the cow and everything else i love that and i i really started to appreciate that patience part right because right. his skill set took x amount of years to get to this point yes and i always tell people too you always get what you pay for when it comes to anything that you do and you learn it from people who are craftsmen and Sometimes we hear these Yelp reviews, not just with food, but things in general, because Yelp people reviews. don't understand what they're paying for. Right. Because you, you could come up to somebody, right? Let's say something as simple as this. And I learned this from installing a washer and dryer. My dad did all that stuff. I never had to do it. I had installed my own washer and dryer here. I didn't know shit about it. I right. hooked it up and right. I was like, this isn't hot. I had to Google it. There's a gas line. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I have to hook up a gas yes. line. I hooked up the gas line. I didn't use painter's tape. I'm like, it's, I didn't it's use, um, I was like, it smells like gas. Yes. What did I do? I had to undo it and I had to get all these other parts. Well, the reason why I had to do that and I didn't pay somebody is because that person is getting paid for what they, for knowledge, for the experience that they have. Yes. I explained that doing it in service business. I literally, largest yeah. septic business for 20 years, pumping septic. And it's like, the reason that we charge what we charge is because we are the best at what we do. Mm -hmm. The proficiency of me being able to walk on your yard and know exactly where your tank is, for me to be able to hand dig these tanks, <laughs> not using a backhoe, being able to dig down, having a cap, being able to dig straight down, pop. It's like, well, I could get somebody else. Like, no, you can't. You're you not absolutely going to. Cannot. It's like, you have fun getting the $200 person because you're going to get what you pay for. I, I spent fucking three days trying to get this washer, this this dryer set up because I didn't get the right parts. I had to wait for the parts. If I paid somebody to do it, he would have got it done in 15 minutes. Yes. <laughs> you know? He had it done, bing, bang, bong. No, yeah. I agree. I'm, I'm definitely from that school. So Absolutely. Like, you know, and that's the stuff. Knowledge also costs money as well, right? Knowledge is power. And so when we look at what somebody else does, is we say, well, I can do what you do. Yes, you can. But it, you're going to take a while to get there first. So there's a reason why you're paying for that type of knowledge. It is craftsmanship work, right? And though I'm using a very simple example with just installing your, your dryer. No, it's a great analogy. You know, it's a great something analogy. as simple as that, I didn't know these things and it took me three days to get the parts because I didn't fucking know. Right. So like when, when people do get these Mickey Mouse jobs done on their house and they start complaining that it's shit, it's like you get what you pay for. It happens like that with also with food. Know your worth. Yeah. Yeah. Know your worth. People don't know their worth nowadays. And it took me a decade to figure out my worth. And even with the show, knowing your worth and being okay and have the conviction of knowing your work. Like, I charge a lot of money to do to do dinners because I give away all of my time to charities and all these other events. Whenever I'm cooking, I'm going to charge your ass. Is it worth every cent? Absolutely. It is an incredible experience. I'm having you laugh. I mean, it's like, listen, 50 cents charge $7,000 for freaking Super Bowl a party <laughs> per person. Like, who even gives a shit about that? <laughs> and if he could charge $7,000, like, how do you quantify? Like, any customer that starts to try to nickel and dime me, they're like, well, isn't that a little expensive? It's like, well, tell your husband. Ask him where do you, where do you quantify the answer too expensive? I said, $185 a head for four courses. Tell me where, where he can get that. Like, tell me where you're at. Because we're using, we're using the Kobe beef and all this great stuff that we're doing. And I just kind of want to know where he thinks the 185 is off. Like, where does he get his numbers from? Like, tell me <laughs> where, where at what point. They, they can't. Like, well, it just kind of sounds like you go to you can go to a freaking club and drop freaking $100,000 on an Ace of Spades bottle. It's like, it all is what... My value is what the hell I think my value is. And it's your choice to spend your money on it or not. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, I used to just $35 a head for a thing, this, that. I'm like, what the fuck hey, am I doing? One of the best quotes that I've ever heard was, my prices aren't based on what you can afford. It's based on what I'm worth. That's well one said. of the, the, the best quotes I've ever heard. Yes. And like, because people try to nickel and dime everybody. It comes with that when you try All to the time. train On fighting. Septic, dude, people would be like, man, I don't got any money. It's like, you know that if you don't pay us, we're bringing this back. Like, okay, maybe we're we'll finding some money. It's like, <laughs> that's what I thought. My All thing the is time. this now, like I've learned the hard way from buying shitty things and getting crappy service. I always say this, hey, if you're worth your money, make sure that I don't ever have to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And they always do a great job. It well, hasn't failed yet. One of my one of my bosses, uh, Rick O'Shea, um, said, "Now listen, Noah. I pay a lot of money. Do you know why I pay a lot of money?" And I'm like, "I 
I can probably guess a couple of reasons why you would pay. <laughs> and he goes, well, what do you think? I said, I'm going to try to knock this out of the park with this answer because I think it is, maybe. Um, you pay a lot of money because you hire the best, and you hire the best so you don't have to do that job that you pay a lot of money for that person to handle, right? He goes, elegantly said, yes, that's exactly right. I pay people money so I don't ever have to fuck with it, Noah. Yeah. If, I can, if I can pay them money and for it to be done, that's the whole reason I'm paying them that money. I can pay them less money, but then I have to maybe worry about them not getting the job done, which is, what's the point? Because I'm getting you this money for you to complete this said task. Yeah. If you can't get that job done, what is the point of me paying you anything? Yeah. Like, that's a good point. I'm sure. A hundred percent. And when you, when we talk about like these personal dinners too, um, listen, I still eat McDonald's. I still yes. eat all this. I eat yes. all the food. I eat all that shit. It doesn't yes. matter. Just because you know, like I've eaten great food, it doesn't mean I don't eat the same shit I grew up with. Right. The, the thing about like when you go out to eat, right, and you're going to a place for an experience, you're not just paying for the food. Like there's, right. there's more to this, right? right? There's there's a lot more to this. And if you could create this at home, be my guest. People don't even want to do their own fucking dishes when they fry a fucking egg. You yes, know what I mean? you're so right. So, God, yes. so what is this idea that you this person just created this dish mm -hmm. that the prep alone took a few days yes. to do it? Yes. You know, sourcing out all these ingredients, using all these different tools and gadgets in here, and then you get this one complete dish, and then you go, I can't believe it cost this much money. Well, guess what? There's no way you would have been able to create this dish and you would have not gotten this experience at home. This is what you're paying for. If you want just food you're speaking, for nourishment. You're, you're perfect on <laughs> You're dead on. Like if you want food for nourishment, you can get that at home. We could eat an apple, eat some eggs, and we're pretty much good to go. Just know what you're paying for. You're right? you're hundred percent well, I had this you say that and that hit a nut. There's probably a good finish off point. I don't know how much time you got, but um I did a job. And I've never not gotten tipped. I, I, as God is my witness, I'm exceptionally good at what I do. I make people just feel so good, so happy. I always go above and beyond. I'm designing every menu is always different. There's never one. I every single dining experience, I never pull a draw sheet or a spreadsheet. Every single one's different. Every fucking appetizer, there are one off fucking things. And I take a lot of pride in how I do that. I cook for this freaking group. And to cook five meals in a row for a group of 15 to 18 people <laughs> in a row out of my house that's 24 minutes away from this house, having to go back and forth doing dinner, then brunch, then lunch, then dinner, then lunch, or breakfast, back to back to back to back to back. Setting a price, getting them an incredible bartender, world-class bartender, getting everything done, and then for these people to have still not paid me, all right, so now it's been six days, six days since I finished the job, half up front when the job has started, half when it's finished. I have not gotten a tip. I did not get anything. These people are supposed to be millionaires flying in on Lear jets, all this stuff. That's crazy. You tell me about how great all the food is, epic. My dad even came out there because I, wanted, I needed help uh, just doing dishes. My dad's like a world class dishwasher. He's fucking great at washing dishes. Um, anything he does really is great at but dishwashing. Anyways, I mean, world class food, some of the best food, <sighs> some of the best food I've ever kicked out in my life. And they still have not f finished the bill. They, they still owe me like $900 yeah. and have not paid me that. And then, and then there's no tip. And it's just like, I, I tell this person I did this and that I would normally charge $7,500 because of how fucking much work it yeah. is to be able to store all of this food. It's not like I'm doing five meals for four people back to back to back. It is fucking 15 to 18 people that I'm having to store in a normal size refrigerator back for doing man. this. All this, like, and I'm doing this, and I tell this person that this would normally be a seventy five hundred to ten thousand dollar dinner, and I'll do it for five because of the, your friend and who all this is. But you know, just just be like, understand how much of a discount you're getting, and the yeah. fact that I'm that she adds two more people on it. I tell her, well, 
That's gonna be that's gonna be three hundred thirty three dollars a person more. I can't believe you even said and yes, dude. Two more people is yeah, so much more. Yes, <laughs> yeah, two more people. It's like, oh yeah, I just toss that on there. That I then literally, she's supposed to pick up a couple things that she wanted. And then my buddy picked them up. That was one hundred seventy seven dollars that she didn't pay me. So they all talk about how this is about a community and all this stuff, and it's me, 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 me. And they're like, what's your superpowers and all this stuff. And then when it comes to the time of paying me for the first time in my life, there was a customer, and as God's my voice, I've never had a refire in my professional career mm -hmm. on a steak, ever. Never. I'm talking in restaurants on game day at UGA. Not nothing. That's really fucking good. <laughs> uh, I had I had a refire with these people. I had 18 perfect ceviche medium rare steaks that were butter crusted, seared off. Flawless. You know how hard it is to cook fucking 18 fillets by yourself and yeah. nail them? Perfect. They were nailed on it. This woman, like, ah, I know I said medium rare, but could you go a little bit more? I took a picture just to make sure I wasn't losing my fucking mind. Hmm. Make sure I was looking at a perfect medium rare, bright, bright ruby. When you ceviche steak properly, when you sear it off, you got that perfect crust. Yeah. And it's just this ruby red and it's perfect. So I fired off to medium. Bring it back. She's like, I hate to be difficult, but can I get this just a little bit more? I'm like, okay, fire it off to well. And I'm like, sitting here being like, these people, one of these people held a plate up like I'm some servant bitch to come by and pick up a plate. <laughs> I about took it like a frisbee and threw it through the glass. Cause like, do y'all know who the, like, what, what the fuck is going on here? And it's like, those people ran me like a dog. And I don't do any marketing before I signed with this person that was this collection. Before I signed with this person, I never had one single person nickel and dime me. Never had one person question what my worth was. I, it is what it was. As soon as I get with this freaking realtor, all that's happened is people call me, email me, nickel and dime me. People just, it's like, they're the richest of the rich people. And it's like, it's, do you think it's telling me a little bit about like society that the richest of the rich people keep trying to pick on the little guy that's like, so what's happened to me? I hammered down my self-worth. I'm self-aware. I don't give a fuck what you think I am worth, you rich bastard. Yeah. Uh, I am this. And either you're going to pay me or you're not getting it. And good luck finding somebody that can do a tenth of what I can do. Yeah. You know, like it goes right back to the point of understanding what your value is and not bending on it. Like yeah. it, you, you're like you said, like you, what what you think I'm worth has no effect. If you want, if you think I'm worth it, great, pay me. If not, goodbye. Have a good day. Yeah, and it's it's not a disrespect. No, it's, it's a respect to me. Thing. Correct. <laughs> you know? Correct. Knowing your self worth. Yeah. The, the self awareness like, on that. I, I feel nothing about you. Correct. Like I understand that you feel that way, but I right. can't change that. But I know yeah. the time and practice it took for me to create the these dishes and what I do. Yes. So I can't I can't dumb myself down because of how you feel. How you feel these and things. And it's perception. Be. It's yeah. like you might think buying a Rolex is great for business. I'm gonna be like, what the fuck <laughs> are you doing? It's yeah. like it's always perception. Yeah. It's like people get so upset. It's like, all right, toodles, like you don't think I'm more than great. I know that I'm literally booked all month. Yeah. I'm fucking slammed. I wish I wasn't so booked. Like, I wish I, but I'm a stud and I want to keep working as hard as I can and work and get through it. And I don't overtake too much where I start to getting down in product. I, I have to be able to balance where I'm still giving 100% product of where I want to be. Never where I get too busy where I start cutting down on my product because my product is my word, my bond. Like, yeah. every time, I never get too much work where I start getting the work hurt. Ever. That's what my dad taught me. Always keep work. If you can work 20 hours and keep it up to 100%, do it. If you can't, don't do it. Figure out where you can keep it the maximum. It's like it's what Sims do. We just fucking try to maximize, yeah. <laughs> get on that cusp and just get on the precipice and just kind of dance and have a little soiree on that line. So <clears throat> I digress, but there we are. I mean, for you, I mean, before we end this podcast, mm -hmm. if somebody wanted to get into I'd say like culinary, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's opening up a restaurant, becoming a personal mm -hmm. chef, what is your advice to give to them? Because um, I think a, a lot of people have a fascination with food now, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that they don't really ask the right people, right? So they ask people who don't have the experience or maybe not even that, just the passion for food in general. So if you, wanted, if you could give advice to a young person that was saying like, look, 
Uh, I've been watching all these TikTok videos. I'm inspired to cook. Mm-hmm. What should I do to get into either the food industry or what should I do to become a better chef? This is a really, this will be, this is a good closing question. This is a great closing question. So if you could listen to one thing that I was going to tell you on this podcast, it would be this. Because not just in culinary, but in this world, people are destinationless. They just are going through the motions without actually understanding where they're heading. So in the culinary field and and in other steps in life, having a destination is so key to be able to achieve all of said goals that you laid down. I believe destination is like one nail in the tree and then you're holding the other nail and you string it up and you're able to dry out your clothes. And if you don't, if you don't get your clothesline hung up on a good support over there, then your clothes are going to fall and never dry. Like you're not going to get anything done. But if you get a good foundation over there and you know where you're at right here, that self-awareness, having that self-awareness is so freaking key. Because how the hell are you supposed to know where you can go if you don't know who you are? Mm. How are you supposed to know where the hell you need to go if you don't know who you are? Like, that's where people get in the wrong places, doing the wrong things, because they didn't know where the hell they were at with themselves. Like, how are you supposed to get to the destination if you don't know where your true location is? When you're in your GPS on your phone, you're like, my current location, and now I'm going to go here. If you don't know where your current location is, how the hell are you going to get to that destination? So many Mm. people overlook that. They don't think about, like, I really need to know where the hell I'm at now. Like... If if you're a if you're a sushi you know rice master of two years, you probably can progress into becoming a sushi master because you spent your two years. The guy that hadn't spent the two years be like, I want to become a sushi master. Well, where are you? <laughs> yeah. You haven't even begun your journey yet. Yet you start stating these things. So many people don't have the patience or the self awareness to understand. So in culinary, if you want to own, if you want to own a freaking little cottage in Ireland and cook. What do you need to do to be able to make that shake? Like, what do you need to do? Your destination's set. You want to be in Galway. You want to open a badass restaurant. Got it. What steps do you need to do? It Subdivide those steps. Break down the analytics on every step that you think you need to do and keep self-awareness on all of those steps. You're like, okay, well, I was wrong here. So clearly if I'm wrong here, it's like Sudoku. Look at it like Sudoku. If I have the nine here, sure shit ain't going to be over here. Like, yeah. it, Look at life like Sudoku. It should line up. And whenever you get it right, if you're paying attention, you should be able to make the puzzle shake just fine. So for me, the advice would be, Understand where the hell you're going, understand where you're at, and then understand the key, the biggest key. Do what makes you happy. Like, it doesn't matter. Nothing matters if you're not happy. Like, what makes me happy, what my destination is, what it is just to change the world. It doesn't matter. My destination is Earth right now. And people are like, what does it mean? It's so vague. If I'm in front of people helping people and I keep moving forward, it does not matter. I don't have to have a destination because I'm I'm happy where I'm at right now. I've met my destination. My destination is right here at this moment. Like my purpose is here. I don't have to. I used to think 15 years down the road at this time in my life that is wound down to right now because I need to focus at the moment. This is where I need to be. I've accomplished to here. I don't need to feel like I need to keep going to be more accomplished because so many people have that false sense of I got to keep going, got to keep going, got to keep going. They can't just enjoy the moment right now, which is what I used to do all the time and not just savor the moment. You've got to be able to understand that to be able to be happy, you have to be you you have to be able to have that self-awareness to realize like things are good. Like, I'm enjoying myself. Like, this is okay. Do I need to keep going? Yeah, but that's okay. Like, me losing weight, I, I've lost 130 pounds. Do I need to lose 30 more, more, more pounds? No, probably about 10 more pounds. Old Noah would have been totally pissed. Like, you fucking piece of shit loser. Like, finish the fucking drill. This mature Noah's like, 
all right, man, you've done pretty fucking good. You've lost a hundred something pounds. Like we're getting better. Things are on the up and up. And it's like having that destination. I still got it in my head on my body, but for my happiness, I'm just fucking just totally fine. I've reached my destination. I'm happy. And like, that's the key to anything in life to be able to be successful is happiness. Yeah. I believe if you're not fucking with anybody, if you're not making someone else's life miserable, if you're not doing anything that's negative to somebody and you're happy, that's it. God doesn't want it. There's, there, there's nothing else. Like, like people are, are stupid. Like, well, what about the bills? What, yeah. about, what about this? You don't understand. Like your brain can't come... If you're happy, then you're happy. Like, if you're not having negative impact on people and you're happy, willfully happy, winning, you're winning. Like, what else is there? There's nothing else. Like, some people might need a Ferrari to make them happy. Some person might not need just sitting under a tree, being totally fine, drinking a Coca-Cola. Whoever, it doesn't matter if it, if you're happy on a jet airliner that's your private jet, great. If you're happy swimming with your kid in the freaking pool, great. Like, God's happy for this guy. God's happy for this guy because they're happy. Yeah. And that's the whole goal. Like, that's my whole goal. My destination is happy town. Like, that's the big one. Right now, we're at a place. Everything else is space in this world, okay? A place is something that you know the destination. Like, I'm at a place right now in my life where I'm not just floating around. Like, I have purpose here. Everything has purpose in your life. If you look for it, you'll be able to see it. And for me, this journey, the journey that we're on, what you what you talked about having having patience, and then it gives you that perseverance. It's like... Like, keep going. Just have that faith and, like, have that have that end game. Like, what is going to make me happy? My grandma always said that. Like, what makes you happy? Helping people. Then, then do it. Do it. Like, who? Like, do it. Like, work your ass off. Like, that would be my advice. Work your ass off and be happy. Like, just don't worry about the money. When you're happy, the money will come. If you're the best at what you do in your in your business, you'll have money. You don't have to worry about that. I think it's very important. Like, I like the, because uh, everybody talks about destination, but they don't talk about where they start. Correct. Right? And if you don't know where you start, you're not going to know where the destination is in the first place Correct. because you have nothing to base anything off no of. No bearings. You don't yeah. have no bearings. <laughs> yeah. And it goes really well with food, too. It's like, you have to know what you're good at and what you're bad at. Correct. You can't just go right into a kitchen to see what the fuck happens. Right. Like, you're never going to get anywhere. Correct. Cool. Well, 100%. Noah, that was really good. Hey, where can they find you, man? Uh, you can find me on uh, Instagram. Uh, that is mountain underscore man <laughs> underscore yeah. Sims. I thought it looked really cool when I came up with that, and it really has taken off. People love that name, but I am a mountain man. Like, I mean, I could Rambo it. I can get a knife and go survive in the woods. Like, I feel very confident in my survival and tracking abilities. Uh, but yeah, you can get me on. I don't do the TikTok thing. Uh, not a not a TikToker. I tried to I do a funny video on that, and I just like this is not my jam at <laughs> all. I'm a big Instagram guy. I love Instagram, Facebook. Richard Noah Sims, S I M S. Thank you so much for having me on here. Hey. I'm so glad to be out in LA. Uh, hopefully, we can probably get some big, bold, beautiful flavored food tomorrow. I think I'm pretty much hey, open tomorrow dinner time. Keep it open before you get on this flight. 100%. We could, uh, we're going to go to Tide Town and we're just going to get a Thai fat Town. fucking spread. I'm we're in. It's fat spread. Drinks, yes. food, yes. noodle soups, right yes. dish, meat, everything. I'm it's going to be good. I'm in. I'm in. I, dude, I live, I live for, for connections, conversations, and eating good food and breaking. Where I'm from, we call it supper, having supper. Uh, and like <laughs> breaking, breaking bread and having a good supper, uh, I mean, I'm always all about that. I'm all about the connections and bringing humanity closer and trying to Fuck yeah. you know, kick the shit out of evil people and weak people and bigoted people and all that stuff. So uh, this has been fantastic, and I appreciate your time. For sure. Well, you guys can catch Genius Brain every Thursdays and Sundays, and we'll see you all next time, everybody. Peace. Peace, guys.